Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative here with the last week in mortgage today and uh, our weekly whirl through all the latest news and developments in the mortgage industry each week. Pleased to be joined by one of our lender members as my co-host this week, longtime TMC member, diehard Cleveland Browns fan, TMC board member, Ohio MBA president, I feel like I need like a scroll here and former boss, a guy I learned a lot from in my career. We worked together at Home Savings and Loan, the EVP over mortgage banking for First Commonwealth Bank, Stan Foraker. Stan, great to see you. Hi, Rich. Great to see you too. Great You're on to see mute. You too. That big, big, great intro. Mm -hmm. I can hear him. Oh, you guys can hear him. Okay. Okay. Everybody can hear him. Uh, it's me that can't hear evidently. So let me figure out my audio issues and, uh, but let's go ahead and get started. So the <clears throat> stand, the, the big news this week is certainly the federal reserve still making news. Uh, last week raised their benchmark interest rate, 75 basis point second meeting in a row. They did that. Uh, was coming off the uh, heels of some inflation data that was, was a little bit hotter than expected. Uh, then we got a GDP report last week that uh, was underwhelming, showed the economy contracting a little bit, has stoked some renewed or increased fears about a recession. And the the uh, market has rallied as a result, not only the bond market and mortgage rates, it's, it affects us, but the stock market as well. Your thoughts on the Fed's latest actions? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Well, before I go there, um, speaking of big news, I mean, there's a lot of big news coming out of Ohio this week. And I want to make sure your, your listeners and viewers, though, got the really big news. It's not, not the Browns news, but it's the fact that the butter cow has been brought back to the Ohio State Fair and after a three-year hiatus. So, you know, I've, I've personally years ago seen the butter cow and I can vouch for the fact that it is in fact a giant cow made out of butter. Um, I don't know if it's salted or unsalted butter, but, um, but that's the other big news about the Fed is certainly something we've been watching. I, you know, the bond market looks to me, I think everybody's probably, there's consensus here sort of had baked in some recovery there, you know, anticipating what the Fed was going to do. And uh, so we're seeing rates moderate a little bit. I, I, at times, honestly, I think watching the Fed at work is like watching a cheesy horror flick. You, you know what's around the corner. You know it's likely to be gruesome, but you just can't take your eyes off of it. And that's kind of what we're experiencing now. And um, so it's, you know, when we think about rates and we think about this, after 38 years of doing this, I've seen all kinds of cycles. Many of the folks you know, in the TMC network have seen lots of cycles. We can't let the press cause us to take our eye off the ball. And what I mean by the press is all the noise that sort of surrounds this. Um, if you spend too much list time listening to the forecasters and not enough time listening to your COIs and your, and your potential borrowers, you can end up sitting in a corner with a blanket over your head, I think. So it can be paralyzing at times to, to, you know, wait and see what the rates are going to do or make your decisions around it. So um, housing, it, you know, it's still core to our economy, right? I mean, every, um, every economist talks about that. Um, regardless of life cycles, housing goes on. People get married and they get divorced. And they, in fact, divorce kind of ends up being good for mortgages because you get two deals out of it. And people have children and and they get job promotions and you know you get the point. So um, I think it's gonna be interesting to watch the Fed, um, again, it's my horror flick analogy. It's gonna be interesting to watch them as they see what happens with, uh, with this technical recession. I think I sort of in, am in that camp that this is a technical recession um, as opposed to a full blown recession just because of labor numbers are pretty strong still, you know, housing continues to have some some momentum to it. So um, that last thing on that point for me, anyhow, is it occurred to me a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little longer ago, that a fair amount of my sales team have never seen 6% interest rates, even 6%. 
Um, you know, when, when were they 6% the last time? 2009, I think it was, something like that. So 13 years. And for, for some folks, that's the entirety of their mortgage career. So, you know, there's an education process on our side to make sure our lenders understand that housing is still very affordable. It's not as affordable as it was at three and a half or 4%, but it's still very affordable. And, um, and so I, I don't want to spend, you know, I try to encourage them to not get too bogged down in watching what the Fed does and what the movement of the rates do. We certainly need to be educated on it, be sensitive to it, and try to anticipate to the degree we can. Excellent historical perspective. And uh, yeah, it, it, you know, you take a look at the current situation and it appears tough, but uh, like you said, those of us that have seen the cycles in this industry before, uh, you know, remember the tale. So it, uh, on a brighter note though, the U.S. House, in new, new segment on Last Week in Mortgage today, headlines, we thought we'd hear in 2019, U.S. House passes remote online notarization bill. Finally. I mean, it, it still may be killed in the Senate, but uh, at least it's good to finally, you know, see that headline after years of talking about this. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I think we keep running into the same issue. Though. I mean, I'm glad to see the legislation. I'm glad to see the sentiment moving that direction. Um, until we get you know, local municipalities, courthouses, even some of our settlement agents in the hinterlands like central Pennsylvania and southeastern Ohio, until some of those folks come online, execution is really going to be the challenge. So legislation will set the tenor, I think, for it. Um, we're certainly still focused on hybrid closings, as lots of our, our TMC members are, uh, because that's the best we can get done today. But I don't think there's any question um, we as an industry need to continue to pursue Ron, and uh, it's going to be the wave of the, it's not even the wave of the future, it's today, it's just a matter of execution right now. So, yeah, but I was glad to see it. I think it's a, I think it's a positive move from a legislative standpoint. This is the last week in mortgage today. I'm Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative this week, joined by the Executive Vice President over Mortgage Banking for First Commonwealth Bank, Stan Foraker, and also um, some news this week. Uh, just in and around home equity loans. Loan Depot made some news uh, a month ago or so saying they were coming out with an equity product. G-Rate did the same a couple of weeks ago. And then Rocket Mortgage, uh, the industry leader, makes some big news this week saying they're coming out with a home equity product. First Commonwealth Bank, you guys are, I'm assuming, writing standalone home equity loans and some piggyback stuff. Uh I would love to just hear your perspective on kind of like that that piggyback, that second mortgage market right now and some of the big national IMBs uh, throwing their hand in the ring. Yeah, so it, it really has been fascinating to watch that, you know, Rocket, Loan Depot, as you mentioned, um, even Thrive uh, came out today with a solicitation, you know, for JV uh, HELOC activity. Um, you know, um, with... I get it, you know, the Gen Z uh, folks, what have 30% increase in their credit card debt, as an example. So the notion, I think Rocket has really touted that, that this is an opportunity to move that debt from unsecured to secured on your home and, it, you know, spread out the payments, make some of that debt service coverage more palatable for folks. But um, it does give me a little heartburn, Rich, to tell you the truth, because, um, once, once we've recalibrated the debt from unsecured to secured, while it provides some short-term relief, it does now eat up all that wealth that's built up in homes in, in, very, quick, in very quick fashion. And as home prices begin to decline, as they begin their descent, which has started already, we've already seen that, you know, it's certainly possible, and we've seen this before, and it, particularly in 2007, eight, maybe in some more in nine, where folks were upside down in their homes. So it concerns me about the management of wealth that's found in housing, to tell you the truth, but I recognize why organizations like they're doing it. And we certainly are very active in it as well. We're careful about, um, I, we're careful about appraisals. You know, we're careful about it. And, there's, you know, I don't know if we're gonna talk about appraisal bias, but with appraisal bias on the other end of that spectrum, it's, it's, um, it, it's still something we're very careful about because we don't, we want to make sure that the superheated home values are sustainable within reason. 
and if you look at the long-term forecasts after 22 for what 23, 24, 25, most of the forecasting says home uh, home appreciation, home value appreciation is going to be back in that average of around five percent. Actually, most of them are predicting in the high threes to to low fours, maybe mid four percent increase in home price appreciation during those three or four year cycles. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see what this does to the, how it impacts families and borrowers and individuals um, as they move unsecured debt to secured debt. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's kind of my take on it. Is it gives me a little anxiety about what this means for us longer longer term? No, and you went. It was very well said. And you went right into where I was going next, and and that is uh, in, just in the pre-show notes I sent over. I, I I referenced a piece about how the impact that inflation is having um, on young low-income Americans, and then breaking just before the show uh, was a report from the Fed actually. Household debt in America at a new high surpasses 16.2 trillion. Um, surpasses 16 trillion for the first time ever at 16.2 trillion. Um, it's up big time. Uh, you know what is that household debt? A lot of it is mortgage balance debt. People refinance stuff and things in the mortgages at these low rates in the last couple of years. And then going circling back to the piece I originally sent you. Young Americans in particular, if you look at the stats on uh, Americans 25 and under, not only the recent trends on the balances of their credit cards, but like the early default, like the 30 day lates, um, the history on that stuff has historically those types of leading indicators have led to worse things. But I think it's it's inflation, right, Stan? It, it's we 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 like I remember on the show like three months ago, almost you know, we were, we kept saying like this, like this economy is just churning in the face of inflation. Well, now it feels like inflation has kind of worn down the country in the economy and it's starting with lower income, younger Americans. So. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I don't know that I can prove this, but I'm not sure anybody can disprove it. I think the, the pressure on wages too, the upward pressure on wages so if in the Gen Z group, so that's what's that? Everybody born after 1997 or something. So you mentioned the early 20s and whatnot. They see their wages increase now. And where do they use that? So that you see this credit card debt going up. I mean, I think it can pre create a false sense of security to a certain extent as they learn how to use credit and certainly as it impacts housing, coupled with the the, the unintended consequence of lots of press about rising rates where it puts some folks on the sideline, even if they haven't done the research to determine if they can, in fact, afford to own a home, where's that money go? What are they going to do with that money? So, so that, that increased wages ends up getting spent in the unsecured world or in, out into the credit world. And so, and then they, they don't manage it well. So yes, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a circular firing squad right now when it comes to, you know, upward labor or upward wage pressure they get some increased wages how do they use credit can they afford housing I, I think probably everybody in the industry knows it's no i'd be captain obvious by stating it that education is a huge part of what we've got to do right now i think education is as important as it's ever been in a rising rate environment to help people understand what it really means to be affordable what it means what the difference is between a payment at five and a half percent and four and you know if that's if that's one less cable bill a month or four, four less pizzas or whatever it ends up being so we got we got to do the work around that and um and then you know i think we're going to talk about affordable housing it's certainly education i'm going to come back to that topic here on affordable housing but so i um i do think that i think do think the boomer generation my generation as wages have maybe increased in this economy you're also seeing, depending on which economist you read, you're also seeing some sentiment that the boomers are uh, pulling back, pulling back spending, are starting to be more conservative again. It's starting to show up in lots of places. So um, we'll see. We'll see what, what happens here. But uh, I, I worry about the Gen Z folks because they're the new first-time home buyers. I worry about them. They're, they're the future of the housing market for us in the days ahead. Year over year, as of the end of the second quarter, so July 1, uh, 
credit card balance is up 11% nationally year over year, but for people 25 and under up 30% year over year. So uh, Stan, talking about affordable housing, which is already under, it's, it's under so much pressure, uh, rates and uh, home values, and now young people, many of whom are seeking this affordable housing, we know that their their credit card balances are uh, you know higher than they've been in a long time. So puts more pressure and strain on first time home buyers and the broader purchase market in our industry. But uh, on the flip side, <clears throat> um, all the equity that people have in their homes. And, you know, coupled with this rising credit card debt, good for our industry. And in that, you know, in addition to divorces and other life events that you mentioned early in the show, you know, oh, you know, refi away from 3% to five and a half. Why the who the hell would do that? Well, okay, if you're moving $40,000 in credit card debt at 18% over, changes the math pretty quick yep. on that. So. Yep, sure does. Sure does. Yep. Yep. So um, other news, uh, a lot of news this week, uh, Fanny and Freddie, uh, you know, continue to be, they were, you know, like Trump and Calabria were trying to get them out from under the government conservatorship. He loses his reelection bid. Uh, Calabria is trying to, you know, furiously get things in and Supreme Court rules, Biden's able to oust them. Um, you since then enter Sandra Thompson, enter a much different voice from FHA and Fanny. And Freddie, one thing they're still doing is making money, uh, $4.7 billion in net income in Q2, which not a great one for our industry. And you talk about privatizing Fannie and Freddie, um, you're talking about $100 billion plus of income annually for the federal government that goes away. It just complicates the situation, right? Yes, yes. I, I think, uh, I do think Thompson's a, a um, uh, constructive voice mm -hmm. in the conversation. I really, I like what I hear out of her. Um, I think, I think there are impacts here, unintended consequences if they go private that we don't even fully understand. Lots of think tanks talking about it. Lots of, lots of work there. I, I do by the way, I, I find it fascinating this, that as a publicly traded company at their earnings release, they do not take questions. I, you know, we're a tr publicly traded company. My, my kids didn't like it when I used to ask them questions, but that was usually because they were doing something they shouldn't be doing, right? So, so I, I'm not sure I understand that, you know, how an organization like Fannie can have a, an earnings release, but not allow questions on that. Having said that, I recognize that this is significant revenue for the federal government. It's a significant underpinning of the housing market. Um, I think there's, uh, it'll be interesting, Rich, if, if in the balance of your career, if this thing gets resolved because of the political implications. So I'm not very sanguine to tell you the truth that it's ever gonna go to privatization, but um, I think it's a fascinating conversation. You're right. There's so many tentacles to privatizing the GSEs and, and many of which would have real world short-term negative connotations for not only housing finance industry, our industry, but just the broader housing economy in general in America. And you have to have, and, and because of those, because of those risks, you have to really have the will to drive that all the way through and deal with all those things. And I'm not sure there's any one body today that's willing to, you know, step up and do that. FHFA, I mean, again, I think Sandra Thompson's uh, a bright light, but that's a long-term uh, project in my view. And honestly, it, it has the, only, the only human that, that would be potentially able to see that through in this climate was Calabria. <laughs> we couldn't get it done. Like, as that guy's like, that dreams at night about uh, getting <laughs> you know, Freddie out from other government control. Yeah. He did everything yeah. good and just ran out of time. And yeah. uh, it would take, I think, a, it would take a Republican to beat Biden, and it would take a Republican that would put somebody like Calabria in that FHFA post to have any chance of anything happening with the GSEs. But to your point, I think that's the best thing for our industry and housing in America right now. Yeah. It's not unlike any big um, organization. I mean, you just, you start working on turning the ship, and it's such a big ship. By the time you start to get it turned, 
then you get a new captain and, and you know, you start going back the other way. So th that, that turbulence in the, the um, strategic will of FHFA, it, you know, in privatization, I, I just don't think it's there today. And again, you're, you're right, Calabria was sort of the poster child for it. And, and as you correctly said, he ran out of time. This is the last week of mortgage today. I'm Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative this week, joined by First Commonwealth, First Commonwealth Bank's Executive Vice President over mortgage banking, Stan Foraker. Stan, you've mentioned affordable lending and affordable housing a couple of times. First Commonwealth Bank really uh, pioneers in this area, doing so many creative, uh, effective things in the markets that you serve. Uh, people from your organization have been very involved with our community first working group, group of community lending professionals that uh, get together monthly to exchange ideas on best way to serve clients and just the housing market in America more broadly. A lot of strain though. I, you know, when I, when I listen in on those community first working group calls, it, it's just, it's a bunch of great people with good hearts that are frustrated because there's uh, they have a lot of great ideas around ways to responsibly put people in homes and set their lives up for success and wealth, yet there's so little inventory. And, um, you know, on the credit, the regulatory side, right, it's not just as easy, you know, you've worked for banks your, your whole life, I would, like, that loan, that makes sense loan that you want to do, that you would maybe do with your own money. A lot of times you can't because of regulatory things as well. So if you could assess kind of the, the affordable lending landscape from somebody sitting in the position of, of leading a community lender. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the big ones right now, Rich. Um, affordable housing in general. You know, SPCP, special purpose credit programs, are now on the on everybody's radar, or certainly will be as a depository. You're absolutely going to have to look at an SPCP, um, which is which is really allows you to target certain groups of people and and penetrate you know uh, the, um, their ability to buy homes. Um, if you're an organization that is not thinking about affordable housing, you should, and, and if you don't, you will, because it's gonna be a high priority among examiners as well. Um, I think MBA with their convergence efforts in Memphis and Columbus and now uh, Philadelphia, you know, they're, they're, they're recognizing that this is, a, this is a need. And, you know, those, those, um, those efforts are really a microcosm of the affordable housing issue where they bring together stakeholders of all kinds in the housing community. And we were, and, and I sit on, the, uh, as do many others, on the steering committee for Columbus Convergence. And we're trying to bring all these stakeholders together to say, how can we use your experience and resources? How can we use yours? How can we marry them together to get the best outcome? My conclusion, and it's wonderful work and it's yeoman's work, but it's difficult because again, you've got multiple priorities, multiple, um, multiple experiences, and you're trying to smooth that out into one coherent message. And so my, my view of it has been in the affordable housing space, you mentioned supply, housing supply, that's a big issue. I think the other issue is education. So I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a mistake when organizations think there aren't funds available to help with this. I think there's lots of money available to help with affordable housing, whether it's a local municipality, it's the Chamber of Commerce, it's advocacy groups, there's plenty of money for down payment assistance, closing cost assistance, all kinds of funds available. Most of which, by the way, have their own unique uh, nuances to it. So it takes some expertise. But education is the key because if you're, an, if you're a low to moderate income borrower, you don't know who to trust. And so, and, and you don't want to say to somebody, I don't understand what credit score means. You just don't want to say that. So you got to trust somebody who will educate you. I think the challenge for lenders, Rich, besides coordinating all of the resources and dealing with the housing supply issue is going to be putting people in a position where we can stay with them long enough to educate them all the way through the process, counsel them, encourage them until they get to the finish line. We're a business that's used to closing in 30 to 45 days. We get a transaction, we move it. Affordable housing is gonna require commitment on the part of all of us to stick for the long haul. I'm talking six months, a year in many cases. And we at First Commonwealth, 
my mantra has been this CRA is the law, but while we're obeying the law, why don't we help people? So our, our focus is what are we doing to help people in this space? How can we help them be successful homeowners? By the way, sometimes saying no is the best way to help someone because they're not ready to be a homeowner. But that goes back to my point that if you stay with them and educate them and encourage them and walk them through the process over the course of time through credit repair, good counseling about you know, what it means to own a home and so on and so forth, we've had a lot of success at the other end of that spectrum. But there's a cost to that. That's, and as a, as a business person, we all understand the cost and the impact of that. So I think affordable housing should be one of the top two or three priorities for every lender out there right now. And, uh, and there's plenty of resources if we can figure out how to coordinate, educate people. And then the housing supply issue, we need another half hour to talk about that. <laughs> Very well said. And uh, the aforementioned Community First Working Group, if you're a TMC member, and aren't involved in our working groups, community first, servicing professionals, marketing professionals, just the 12 different groups comprised of like industry professionals getting so much out of their monthly interactions with one another. Some info in the chat on that. Um, Stan, the last issue I'd love to get your perspective on is just the construction lending side of our business. I learned much of what I know about construction lending from you. We work together at uh, Home Savings and loan. Uh, New York Times came out with a piece last week that uh, made some noise in, in that it, the point made a, several valid points about like, listen, nobody is building any homes under half a million in America. We already have a major problem. It's getting worse by the day. Nothing is happening to change it. And this is just going to be a disaster in a few years. And went down the road of almost suggesting uh, the the government needs to get into the home building business. So uh, as somebody that does some construction to permanent lending and has throughout your whole career, um, you would just welcome your perspective on, on the construction side of our industry right now. Yeah, I love talking about it. It's, it's a difficult one right now. And I read that article you forwarded, Rich, and it hit, it was spot on in that the problem really comes at the local level. It's like politics, it's all local. And when it comes to construction lending, really working with those local municipalities and organizations, that's really the challenge. And so um, I think the National Association of Home Builders has it right when they talk about the fact that they, it's, they, they will tell you that it's something like, on average across the country, $94,000 in uh, fees just to put an average home down. So if it's $94,000 in fees, how, how can you afford as a builder to build it? $175,000 starter home. You just can't. You can't make any money at it. So when you start talking about the government getting into home building, I, I have visions of Section 8 housing going up everywhere, right? I'll be at, I'll be at maybe zero lot line housing. So that's a, that, and the, but the construction business has its own set of problems, right? With supply and labor issues. Every, almost every, not every, but many of the construction loans we have in play right now are elongated where it should have been nine months to build. It's now 12 or 13 or 14. So that's creating all kinds of issues for the potential home buyers. It's certainly creating potentials for the or potential problems, big problems for the builders themselves. And that's why you're starting to see contracts slow. You'll see some data on that too, that construction contracts are starting to slow now. That's because the builders recognize they can hardly deliver what they've got now in the queue, much less put much, much else on. Premiums were huge. We, we saw significant after closing requests for increased deposits. Um, that's dampened some enthusiasm for construction. It was a natural it was a natural outgrowth, by the way. And I know we're running up against time. It was a natural outgrowth of the fact when home prices shot up so high, everybody said, I can't get a house in contract. So what I'll do is I'll go and build. But when everybody went to build, then construction costs skyrocketed as well. So it's it's really a conundrum right now to use a word my grandfather would have used but um it's i don't think again it's sort of like it's sort of like the privatization of the agencies i don't think there's a solution yet that we've identified that seems to to check all the boxes when it comes to housing supply it's and it starts with sometimes depositories like us in development lending for instance that's another conversation too again we, we're out of time but um i think i think new construction is important it's an important part of the economy. I think it's got a lot of problems that we better keep our eye on and be careful that we don't um, 
put legislation or other roadblocks in the way that impede new construction in the days ahead of whatever, whatever stripe it might be. Very well said. And Stan, always really enjoy talking about the industry with you, getting your perspective. Uh, great work, as always, in the co-pilot seat today. And you're uh, yeah, certain to get the return invite. So, Hey, Rich, listen, butter cow on everybody's bucket list. Go to the Ohio State Fair. You got till, I think it's Friday. It's still there. So got to love Ohio. So, uh, and to our viewers and listeners, thanks as always for taking 30 minutes of your week out with us. Uh, we're here every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern with the last week in mortgage today, live on Zoom. Uh, also find us on YouTube where many of you watch after the fact and on podcast where the majority of you listen for our podcast listeners. Come join our live audiences. They've really been growing today. We're up 60, 70 live. So fun to interact with the live audience as well. So until next Tuesday, have a great rest of the week and weekend, everyone. And Stan, thanks again. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, guys.